I want to speak tonight concerning keeping the mind under the blood. Keeping the mind under the blood. I would like for you, if you have your Bibles, to turn to Matthew chapter 26, just a couple of verses of Scripture, where Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane praying, asks his disciples to pray with him. And in verse 40, Of chapter 26, he cometh unto his disciples and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? And then this admonition I want to impress upon your hearts tonight, where Jesus said, Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. For the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Amen, amen. I wonder why it is there's so much vagueness about the need for Christians to watch and pray lest they fall into the snares of the devil, into temptation. So little teaching and stress of it, why there's so much vagueness concerning the reality of demonic, satanic activity in the world today, why Christians are not being warned against the dangers of occult participation. Why it is that so many churches try to obscure the fact, not only they don't teach what they should, but uh, try to obscure the fact that really all the trouble, the source of it is satanic. Disease, mental illness, suicides, drug, alcohol addiction, whatever it is. The reason that there's so much vagueness and so many attempts to obscure this is because The church has made the devil a doctrine. He's no longer a reality to most Christians. But even more, Satan himself uses scripture to try to obscure the reality of his power and his influence in the human life, human affairs. And how does he do this? Well, the average Christian, he has them running around quoting verses like 1 John 4, 4. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world thinking that's all they have to say, and then they, they can ignore all the other admonitions like watch and pray or be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, or the admonition to, to resist the devil, or the admonition to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil and so on. Yes, the devil uses scripture, and he has Christians quoting scripture to obscure his own power and influence in their life. I had a woman rush up to me in Pittsburgh several years ago where I was speaking at a charismatic conference on the occult, and I'd given dozens of examples out of my experience of how Christians, we had prayed for Christians to be delivered from all sorts of oppression because of their occult involvement. She said, I don't believe. She wanted to let me know what she didn't believe. I'm always happy to know what people do believe. But she said, I don't believe a Christian can be oppressed or possessed with another spirit. Then she quoted 1 John 4, 4, For greater is he that's in me and he's in the world. The Holy Spirit's in me and the devil's out in the world. See, I can't be oppressed. Well, I don't know what answer you can give people like this except to say that it's either God or the devil causing these people were trying to help all the trouble. And when I rebuke the devil, they get help, they get set free. And so that satisfies me as to the source of what the problems are. It's rather naive to say what some people say and what they think and believe. There's nothing like the baptism of the Holy Spirit, friends, to cure you of your uh, erroneous ideas concerning the reality of the devil and his power and influence in human affairs. Because when you receive the baptism, you begin to read the scriptures with new eyesight. Illumined by the Holy Spirit, you see, as the Bible says, that God created not only a physical dimension that we're all looking at and feeling right now, but he's also created an invisible spiritual realm made up of angels and archangels and cherubim and seraphim and living creatures and principalities and powers, thrones and dominions and authorities and many things we don't even know about because he hasn't chosen to tell us out there in the spiritual dimension. So there's nothing like the baptism of the Holy Spirit to make the devil real. Uh, He's real, friends, but without the Holy Spirit, you don't realize how really, really is. (laughs) 
Jesus said, watch and pray. I think that's enough admonition to tell us to watch and pray lest we fall into the snare of the devil. And churches are placing a great deal of emphasis, as they should, of course, on the soon appearance of Christ, but very few are emphasizing the appearance of the devil. And the scriptures make much of the need of us watching for his appearance. We're told in 1 Peter 5 that he goes about. We're to be sober, vigilant, on our toes, because he goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom we may devour. Well, it doesn't do much good to watch unless you know what to look for, does it? And uh, the average Christian on the basis of 1 Peter 5, 8, if they get to watching for the devil, they're looking for the wrong thing to appear. Uh, they're looking for a roaring lion and think they don't have anything to fear until they hear him roar. But he doesn't appear that way. He goes about that way. That's his purpose, to devour you. But how does he appear? <laughs> it's an angel of light. That's the way he appears. Well, he has two basic methods to deceive you and to gain victory in your life. And of course, he's already got the victory in those who say they can't be oppressed by him or have nothing to fear and they can quote some scriptures. The devil quoted scripture to Jesus. I don't think he's above quoting a verse or two to you or trying to get you to quote a verse back to him. As long as he can delude and deceive, well, he has two basic methods, and one is he works through the mind or intellect, and the other he'll work through appearance. And he'll get you in one or the other snares if he can. Because Christians have not been taught his methods, because there's no real emphasis among charismatics upon teaching today, then the devil has many ways to very subtly pervert truth and get you off into something that's not God, whether it's submitted body or that Jesus died spiritually and so on. Uh, and then he beguiles like he did Eve. He'll get you to following some false ministry. He'll get you to following signs and miracles that only tell you they're supernatural in their source or origin. They don't tell you what the origin or source is. And so he has many ways to deceive. But I want to deal basically with those two tonight, where he tries to work through the mind or intellect and through appearance. In 2 Corinthians 11.3, 2 Corinthians 11.3, Paul speaks of Satan's power to work through the mind and to deceive. When he says, <clears throat> but I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. Satan works through the mind and intellect. His basic purpose is to gain access to your mind, to your thoughts. Do you know why? Well, he knows Scripture better than most Christians. He knows what Proverbs 23, 7 says and what it means, that as a man thinketh, in his heart, so is he. So he wants to get into your mind so he can control your thoughts. If he controls your thoughts, he controls you. Because you are what you think. As a man thinketh, so is he. Women too. <laughs> you see, the communists know the power of the brainwashing technique which they've perfected. They know how to get into a man's mind. It's through, it's through propaganda or it's through brainwashing of prisoners. And they've got a lot of them. And they know that if they can get into a man's mind, they're going to control the mind. If they can get into your mind, they'll either win you to their ideology or they will break you down. And therefore, you're, in either case, you're no threat to them. Now, the devil knows this. In fact, the communist got it from the devil. <laughs> the devil knows this, so he works to gain access to your thoughts, the thought realm, to the intellect, to the mind. Because he knows, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And the average Christian is woefully deficient in in underestimating the power and ability of Satan to deceive. Deceive you, friends, all of you out there. You say, well, that couldn't happen to me. He's talking about all those people who doesn't sit under ministry like this or something. Christians largely underestimate Satan's ability to gain access to the thought realm and to influence them and to control them in ways, dear friends, right in your life right now. He's controlling some areas of your life. And God wants you to get that mind under the blood because it's only as you keep the mind under the blood, it's only as you submit every thought to Christ, that is, bring every thought in subjection to him, only then will the mind be safe, closed to him, 
Otherwise, it's going to be open and vulnerable to his, uh, to his, to access by Satan, and therefore controlled and influenced by him. He has powerful spirit forces that are constantly at work in the thought realm. Wrong thoughts, resentment, evil thoughts, lust, bitterness, hate, whatever it may be, doubt, fear, anxiety, failure, whatever the thought may be that is not edifying to you and glorifying to God is a spirit. These thoughts are spirits. As I told you once in another message on spiritual warfare, how the missionary in Africa said that as she battled in the thought realm, she tried to pray to concentrate on Christ and uh, spiritual matters, how just thoughts, unworthy thoughts, useless thoughts, idle thoughts, thoughts of doubt and fear and unbelief, and pride, every kind of thought just kept breaking in. You've gone through this. If you've ever prayed, you know what you battle with. And she said, the Lord, she cried out to the Lord, and he gave her this vision and saw this head with a helmet on it like the knights used to wear. And God showed her this was a demon. And this demon was in charge of innumerable hosts of spirits and all had the names of certain thoughts, you see. And he said he was over this host of evil spirits and that he was the one that was penetrating her defenses and causing her all of this anxiety and concern concerning her spiritual inability to, to have spiritual communion with the Lord the way she wanted. Thoughts are spirits. That is wrong thoughts are spirits. And they seek to invade the mind, and you've got to do what we're told in 2 Corinthians um, chapter 10, one chapter over, in verses 3 and 4. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Verse 5, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And here's what we're to do to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. God demands that we bring every thought into subjection to Jesus Christ. The average Christian, again, does not see the importance of doing this. But if you do not think that your mind is not the battleground in the war between God and Satan for control of your life, if you do not think that if you try to subject every thought to Jesus Christ, that you won't immediately find yourself in a great spiritual warfare, I challenge you to try to direct your attention to Jesus Christ for 30 minutes. You won't be able to do it. You'll find soon enough what kind of a battle you're in. In fact, most of you couldn't do it for five minutes. Every thought in subjection to Christ. Go ahead and try it. I'll give you two minutes. You couldn't do it for two minutes, most of you. You know what I'm talking about? Well, if you don't, you haven't been praying. It is a battle with the forces of darkness. The mind must be kept under the blood. Every thought must be brought into subjection to Jesus Christ. Now, what are his methods? Well, I want to show his methods tonight. If you turn over to Matthew chapter 13, you won't see how the devil works. He has three methods to gain access to your mind and to control and influence your thoughts. Chapter 13 and verse 4. You know, these, this is the chapter where Jesus gives all the parables. Verse 3, spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow, and when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Now, for the interpretation of that parable, I believe, yes, verse 18, Hear you therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catches away that which was sown in his heart, and this is he which receives seed by the wayside. Well, the wicked one is the devil, and we're told here that when you don't understand the word, he comes and snatches away the word that you heard tonight, this morning, whenever you're hearing the word. Now, I'll ask you one question. How does he know when you don't understand the word? As an intelligent spirit, he can read your thoughts. That's how he knows. Oh, you're dealing with a powerful foe. He's the God of this world. He's the prince of the power of this air. 
He was one of the highest beings in heaven till he was cast out. He was so powerful, he even tried to usurp the throne of God. This is who you're dealing with. It's silly to sit out there as Christians do so many times, naive about the foe we're dealing with when Jesus said, watch and pray. When the Bible says, be sober, serious, vigilant, on your toes, your adversary goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's talking to Christians, isn't he? And so as an intelligent spirit, he can read your thoughts. He knows what's on your mind. You say, how can he read my thoughts? The same way that a psychic can. Telepathy, ESP. The devil invented it. Gene Dixon can read thoughts. Spiritualist medium can read thoughts. Or it works another way when the word of knowledge is working in a spirit-filled Christian. Sometimes you know what people are thinking. You don't know how you know, you know it. Time and again in our meetings, as we've traveled about, I've known what people are thinking. I remember one time in Tampa. And you don't plan these things, they just happen to you. Because the Lord shows you things. And I was preaching on positive thinking and confession. And that was the emphasis I was giving. Positive thinking, positive thinking, and then you'll get a positive answer, you know. And as I was stressing a point on positive thinking, just like that, a point, and I said, somebody right there said, that's Norman Vincent Peale. I said, no, it isn't. This is God's word. I said, it's right there. I said, now God wants you to listen to what he's trying to tell you because <laughs> this isn't Norman Vincent Peale. He has a book, Positive Thinking. You know. I said, this is the word of God. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And then we went on and finished the message. Next day he came. He said, let me tell you, he said, when you pointed right there, he said, I had no sooner thought the thought till you said. He said, I had just thought. Why, he's just like Norman Vincent Peale. And he said, I was so impressed with that demonstration of the word of knowledge. He said, I've been on the fence about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. But I was so impressed with that, I went home and got it. <laughs> so praise the Lord. If Christians can read thoughts and we're in the natural realm when God opens thoughts to us, surely the devil who is a spirit can read thoughts because thoughts are spiritual. You are spiritual. Thoughts are spiritual. It's like the transmission of radio waves. The mind is a transmitter and thoughts are going out. And another mind can be a receiver if a person is psychic or if they have, the, as a spiritual Christian often has, the word of knowledge operating. So... This is why we must keep the mind under the blood because old Slewfoot can read your thoughts. He knows what you're thinking now. And he knows when you're having a hassle with something we're teaching up here. And so he just works overtime. He just, he just calls in some reinforcements to convince you that what's going on here is not what happens in your Baptist church. And it must not be God or you would have already known about it. The thought realm. You, are, you gain victory or you're defeated right here. Whatever works out in the visible realm has already occurred in the mind. As a man thinketh, so is he. As a man thinketh, so is he. Couldn't be any other way. And so the devil knows when you don't understand the word. He doesn't mean that you lack the ability, that you're an imbecile or you're uneducated. He means when you're not receiving it in your heart. You can't understand it till you receive it in your heart. Oh, you can sit back there. Sometimes people get in, they criticize, and they come to spy out the land because people constantly, I don't mean like every service, praise God, but they'll come up here. Happened today. I want you to forgive me because I sat back there and judged you and I criticized. It just happens all the time. But praise God, God opens their minds. That's what they're doing up here, apologizing. They don't need to apologize to me. I just want to tell you, friends, any time that you've ever had a wrong thought against me or this ministry, you just take it up with the Lord. You don't have to come tell me. You don't edify me to tell me you used to hate me. <laughs> but if that makes you feel good, go ahead. And I'm not saying that to criticize anybody. Some people have to get it off their chest. I just don't go around trying to make up all the mistakes I made in the past and tell people, you know, for a while I just couldn't stand sight of you, but the Lord, <laughs> the Lord delivered me of that. No, I wouldn't tell them that. But the devil knows when you're not receiving the word. 
It's not a question of understanding it. We can't understand it if we don't receive it. How in the world could you understand something you didn't receive? You sit back there and reject it and reject it and reject it. How could you understand it? You wouldn't know whether it's truth or not as long as you're rejecting it. Another method of the devil is, as we see here in the same verses, is that he's able to remove from your mind what word has been sown if you leave it lying on the surface of the mind and don't let it assimilate, penetrate the heart and assimilate it into your heart. Verse 4 told us about the seed. Verse 19, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not receive it, then comes the wicked one and catches away that which was sown in his heart. He has the power to take it away. Now, you may not be a person who's opposing the word. You're just not with it. You're just not interested. You're just uh, somewhere else. Your thoughts are on your cares or your problems. And you're sitting here. You love the word. You love the ministry. That isn't the point. But you're not really receiving the word. Therefore, you're not understanding it before you get down to the bottom of the steps. The old wicked one has come and plucked away the seed. I mean, he has methods, or he can plant doubts in your heart, or skepticism, or unbelief, or fear about it. He has many ways of removing the seed. He sows his tares, you know, he'll challenge what is said here in your thought realm, and sow his tares so that he robs you of the benefit of the seed that was sown, or he just erases the tape. You ever gotten home? You know you were there. Someone says, well, what did he speak on tonight? Oh, well, he had a good message. Uh, uh, let's see. Now, he gave us a topic. Well, now, let's see. He spoke from Romans 13. No, I think it was first. Well, wait. <laughs> you know, I can't remember a thing. Yeah. Ever had that happen? Yeah. wasn't because you weren't with it and loved the word and all of that, but you were not, you were not in a position of receiving it. And the wicked one snatched it away. And God might as well have said, let's skip Sunday as far as he or she is concerned. Let's just skip that day because they're not going to profit at all. Look at the time I could save. Look at the time everyone could save if we're not going to listen. If we're not going to profit from it. So he has the power to snatch it away. He can erase the tape. You ever taped anything? Thought you hadn't got home and the tape was blank? That's the way it happens if you don't receive the word. You see when the seed is being sown here, or anywhere the word of God is being sown, you have the solemn responsibility of giving serious attention to it as it's being sown. Or the wicked one will come and snatch it away. And then uh, a third method he uses, and this is the most destructive and dangerous, is in Acts 5.3. He has the power, he has the power to plant his own thoughts. And this is what you have to guard your mind against most of all. Acts chapter 5 and verse 3, the account of Ananias and Sapphira. You know, they lied concerning a certain piece of ground they sold. In verse 3, Peter said to Ananias, Why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? Where did he get the information? Where did he get the idea? Where did the lie come from? Satan. Satan has the power to fill your heart with his seed, with his thoughts. And this is why you must keep your mind under the blood, every thought brought into subjection to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the enemy has access to your mind. Now, if some of you don't want to believe that, then you're just going to be in the wrong meeting tonight. The devil's going to do his work in your mind that we're trying to warn you against. He does have free access to your mind, except you keep it under the blood consciously and subject every thought to Jesus Christ, you see. The point is he has the access, and so the battle is yours. The Lord isn't going to do it for you. Now, God won't invade your thought realm. He'll respect your liberty. The Word of God says that. The wicked, God is not in their thoughts at all, he says of the wicked. They willfully keep him out. They have the power to keep God out. God won't invade the mind. Satan can't unless you give him access. The most, except in cases of demon possession, the most the devil can do is use the power of suggestion, introduce these ideas to your mind, use the power of suggestion, try to get you to pick them up. Don't underestimate these two methods because of their destructive power, because remember, the whole world was plunged into chaos and ruin because Eve allowed Satan access to her mind. 
and listen to his suggestions. That's the only power he has. He has the access if you will receive his suggestions. He can only use the power of suggestion. He can only suggest his ideas and his wrong thoughts. It's up to you to accept them or not. And so because he has access, because he's a highly intelligent spirit, now he doesn't use some crude method that would give away his presence or offend your spiritual sensibilities. His methods are of the highest order, and he is subtle beyond degree. He beguiles. He didn't come up directly, you know, and plunge man into sin. We're told Eve was beguiled by the serpent. He used... The th in the thought realm, suggestions called into question God's goodness to Adam and Eve, that he's trying to withhold some blessing from them, but not letting them eat of the one tree. They only could eat of the 99. And you know, God said, that tree's mine, don't touch it. He said, well, you see, he's being selfish. So he beguiles and he seduces, seducing spirits. That's what they're called. He deceives, deceiving spirits. And his powers of suggestion are so subtle and so tremendous that he can deceive or gain access to the mind of everybody sometime unless they're very, very careful against these methods. Beguiles, just like he did Eve. To beguile means to, well, in 2 Corinthians 11:3, he said, I fear lest by any means that you should be beguiled. You know, your minds turn from the simplicity that's in Christ. Beguile means to delude or to, to mislead by charming words. That's how I came to Eve, you recall, with those charming words. And sometimes he works directly, sometimes he works through his ministers. I know of one case where there is an evangelist, calls himself a prophet, an evangelist, who goes about a large part of the world, a magnetic, dynamic speaker, can charm a whole audiences. If he'd be here tonight, he'd have half of you on your feet already. I mean that literally. He can charm whole audiences with his oratory. And on the side, he has a habit of charming women and seduces them with his words. And he's very successful over half the world. Beguiles him. You see, he doesn't come out directly and make a suggestion, but he gives him this sob story. I'm God's prophet. My wife's off there in Israel, uh, off there in Lebanon, and uh, we're having problems at home, and she doesn't submit to me as a wife, and these are just normal needs that you have, the sexual needs. And since I'm God's prophet, if you submit to me, then you'd be serving the Lord. Well, praise the Lord. You can see through the charming, beguiling words, but women all over half the world are not seeing through it. And this is no idle charge, friends. These are facts because it's happened to people we know. Where there's smoke, there's fire. Where there's a lot of smoke, there's a hot fire. And there's a lot of I'm personally, I'm personally acquainted with two cases, besides all the others that I know about and heard about. Beguiles. I don't say anybody could be so foolish, but nevertheless, it happens. And then he's a deceiver. Beguiles, he deceives. First Timothy 4.1. In the latter days, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed seducing spirits. Seducing spirits. He seduces, that is, to lead away from the truth by convincing argument are false facts. Sometimes the devil uses scripture to seduce people away from truth. I know one of the seminaries I attended, oh, they wouldn't stand in the classes and say the Bible's not inspired. No, they were much more subtle in that. They seduced the students into giving up their faith in the integrity of the Word of God. They would say, this is not God's Word as it stands, but you can find God's Word in it when we teach you how to discover it. You see, they wouldn't say that the Bible isn't inspired. They just say that the way we have it now, it's not God's Word, and this is why we're here studying, so we can discern uh, man's additions, what the apostles and the later church added to what they thought, you know, uh, was revelation and so forth. 
Now, most of your seminaries approach the Bible this way. Most of them. They don't deny the miracles outright. They explain them away. They take all the supernatural out of them. They don't deny that God provided manna for the children of Israel and Egypt, but they tell you, you can go over there today and find this honey-like substance still growing on some bushes. Of course, the Bible says it came down out of heaven every morning. And they could not gather too much any one day or it would get full of worms. The only day they could ever gather for two days would be the Sabbath. For the Sabbath. And then it wouldn't spoil. That sounds supernatural to me. Amen. But they don't deny the miracle. They don't deny that, that uh, Jesus turned water into wine. They just explain about this and that and the other. So that they take away the miraculous element out of it. They're seducers. One class that I studied under, this has been many years ago, but the professor, you see, it was a high, it was advanced class in graduate school, and he gathered the students around him that he could tell were more serious, receiving what he was teaching, his denials of biblical truth, and said, now what you're to do when you get out in the pasture is to gather a group around you in the church that you can give the deeper revelation to. You just can't stand in the pulpit and hold this up and say it's not God's word. But get you a few that you can trust and show them the scientific approach to the Word of God and, and show them the ridiculous idea of there being a universal flood or a serpent talking and man and a woman created and a woman out of a man's rib and all of that. And then when you gather two or three around you, a group that will support you, then you can begin to bring these things forth in the pulpit. Seducers. You'd think students would rise up in arms because they... They should know better, but they were seduced. You could count on your right and left hand those who came out uh, untainted. That's how few there were. And he's a deceiver. Deceiving spirits are in operation. Uh, you run into these spirits all the time. We've had them try to get into the church. Had a man in here, and I told him he was deceived, you see. And finally, I just told him he had to be quiet in the church because he was confusing the people, but get up and say, you know, there's nothing in the Word of God that says there's power in the blood, therefore we shouldn't sing the song Power in the Blood. He says, now I know there's power in the blood, but there's nothing in the Word. So I called him into my study, and I said, well, you sang Amazing Grace, but there isn't anything in the Bible about saying that grace is amazing. <laughs> I said, brother, you've got a deceiving spirit and you should submit yourself to deliverance. Then he got up another time and gave us a 15-minute lecture on we should never pray in the name of Jesus. He said that was his earthly designation. You should either pray Jesus Christ or the Lord Jesus, but never just Jesus. Well, I read in Philippians 2 where the time's coming when every knee in heaven and earth will bow at what? The name of Jesus. Amen. Oh, I'm all for you praying in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ or the Lord Jesus, the name of Jesus. But when you say, I can't pray in the name of Jesus, I know that's a deceiving spirit talking through you. And that's what I told him. It is a deceiving spirit. You see how subtle the devil is striking at the two things that had power over him, the blood and the name through this man. Oh, wouldn't the devil like to get us not to sing there's power in the blood or not to pray are to use the name of Jesus in our prayers and get bound up in some legalistic this and that about you have to pray a certain way, a certain formula. And then the power of suggestion. You see, the reason he has such success in Christians' lives is because of his powers of suggestion. See, he not only, as the Bible says, has the power to read your present thoughts, he knows right now what you're thinking, good or bad. He doesn't like it when it's good. He not only has the power to know your thoughts now, but here's the thing. He has the ability to know everything that's ever happened to you. He knows all of your past. He has immediate access to all that information, all your past mistakes, weaknesses, failures, sins, faults, and all of that. And through the power of suggestion, when you find yourself in a situation where you're undergoing a trial or a temptation, you see... He knows all that past information. He knows your present emotional state. He knows what you're thinking. And so through the power of suggestion, he's able to disguise his own presence and implant into your mind thoughts to react in that situation a certain way to ensnare you and to deceive you. And you think it's your own idea and it sounds great until it's all over with and then you saw that the devil deceived you. 
You know, take the matter where somebody is speaking evil of you or of us as a church. Like the <laughs> <laughs> oh, friends, don't fall in the snare of the devil. Don't try to answer that. The devil would keep you busy trying to answer the charges you're going to get. As we preach every day here, every Sunday from the book of Acts, I don't think there's a message. We've not warned you of the persecution that's coming. This is nothing to what's coming. <laughs> and if you don't know about the article in the paper, forget it. You don't even want to waste your time to read it. We deal with those things through prayer. We praise the Lord for the fact that we're worthy to be despised and ridiculed for his name's sake. And you pray for those people. Pray that God will save them, baptize them in the Holy Spirit. They will become uh, the best witness for raising the dead and divine healing in this area. Don't get upset. Don't try to fight it. Don't try to answer charges. I've had 23 years of persecution. Enjoyed every moment of it. <laughs> because, no, I don't have a persecution complex because I've been psychoanalyzed by the seminary psychologist. They couldn't understand why I didn't get upset over a matter. They just shake their head because I came out with all the right answers. I was supposed to be upset. I even had professors come and say, we just want to commend you for the spirit you have about this. See, they closed the door on me to get my doctor's degree there, and they legally couldn't do it. Because academically, you see, I had such a high record, there's no way. And they said, we'll let you work on a master's degree. I said, okay, I'll get my doctor somewhere else. And they couldn't handle that because they thought I would reject that, and then they'd be rid of me. <laughs> because I was one of the few conservatives that went through the seminary. And they just can't handle that. They really can't because it's a liberal school. I'm talking about a Baptist seminary, any Baptists out there. And they couldn't understand why I wasn't upset, why I didn't have a nervous breakdown, why I didn't get all anxious and, and just, you know, fuss because I had the record. They couldn't understand anybody who made straight A's. That wouldn't get upset when they closed the door because they didn't want to put a doctor's degree out through a man that believed the Bible. <laughs> I said, can I get a doctor's degree here if I believe the Bible has inspired the Word of God? They said, you'd have a very difficult time. I was told that. I was asked before they knew I was conservative. I was asked as a beginning student in Hebrew to, to do my doctorate in Old Testament. I was planning on doing it in theology. And they, they don't come to beginning students and ask them, will you do your doctorate in a certain field and I want you to be my fellow. And, you know, that's a student teacher along with a professor who takes you under his arm and he, he gets you through. When they found out I was conservative, that's all I ever heard about a doctor's degree. And so when they said, we'll let you work on a master's, they thought I'd never take that. That'd be too degrading. And so I said, I'll do it. And so they sent me to the school psychologist to see if I was all right. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, he's got all the right answers. So they admitted me. <laughs> so no, I don't have a persecution complex. I don't have any kind of a complex but Jesus complex. <laughs> And if that's a complex, I'm proud of it. And when I say I've known persecution for 23 years and enjoyed every minute of it, I mean that with all my heart because the Word of God says rejoice when you're persecuted. Amen. Don't get worried and upset. He says leap with joy. <laughs> and you're not maturing in Christ if you let these things upset you because this is nothing. Believe me. This is nothing. I've warned you, as Paul says, I've warned you three years with tears what's coming. And this is nothing. This is only the beginning of the things we've said. The time will come, I've said, where you can't meet here. They won't allow you. Time is coming. Some of you will be put in jail to pray for the sick. You'll have to learn to speak the word of faith so you can't lay hands on them. 
That'll be medical healing. You'll have to do like Smith. They threatened after he'd already planned a meeting in Switzerland, to, and thousands would come to his meetings. They found out he was going to pray for the sick, and they said, if you touch one person, we'll have you arrested for, for practicing medicine without a license. So he went on and preached his message on healing. He said, he said, now the Lord's going to heal everyone, has faith for it, lay hands on yourself and believe it. <laughs> And great, great miracles happen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Because you see, he didn't heal anybody anyway. It's a faith message. Oh, yes, there are gifts of healing. You understand why and when they operate. It's like when we said that we're anointed to pray for the babies. Well, praise the Lord. Then that's the time to come to get under the anointing if you want to. But as he discovers that you've got a weakness in an area or there's something in your past, you see, like as I started to say, or as I am saying, that if someone's lying about you or misquoting you or misrepresenting you and he knows you've had a battle in the past with that before you got the Holy Ghost and could overcome, <laughs> and he knows you've got a problem there, had a problem there, that you're it was always your tendency to justify yourself and explain your position and run around trying to get people on your side. So through the power of suggestion, he'll say now, you know, you're not going to go tell that person off who's lying about you. You just want to set the record straight. So go over there to their house and set the record straight. First thing you know, you're in the flesh. In fact, you're in the flesh when you listen to him. And then at too late, after the argument's over and things are worse than before, and you didn't justify a thing, and everybody in the church thinks you're wrong because you're running around trying to explain your view. That's all they're going to think. Then you discover you fell into the snare of the devil. He knows how to read your thoughts. He knows your emotional state. He knows what it takes to turn you on and off. He knows your past. He has the best file system on you, better than the government. Yes, he does. He knows things they don't know about you and your taxes. <laughs> Amen. There are things the government does not know about my past. He knows. And he'll use it against you if you're not careful. Keep the mind under the blood of Jesus. If you're not charismatic, you can do it anyway. But it helps to have the baptism. If you're not charismatic, the expression is foreign to you. But you put the mind under the blood. Consciously, my mind is under the blood. I go down the highway sometimes saying, my mind's under the blood. Get out of here, devil. I refuse that thought. Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. The battle is won or lost in the mind. Bring every thought in subjection to Christ. That which won't glorify him and edify your brother or sister, cast it out. Amen. Say, I'm going to bring a thought into mind that will be under the subjection and lordship of Jesus Christ concerning that person or situation. You ought to try it. It works. So he works through the mind or intellect to deceive you and to gain victory in your life. And then I say he works through appearances, false miracles, false prophets, false signs. He's a deceiver, and he'll try to get you to following ministries that are not God. Deceive you in many, many ways by appearance, feeling. I'm sick because I feel sick, everybody says. Or he appears as an angel of light when he's really old cloven hoof himself. 2 Corinthians 11.3. You know, I've never been able to discover anywhere in the Word of God where Satan is portrayed as he is depicted in the books and literature about him. I was always led to believe he's some horrible, hideous creature with horns and hooves and a pitchfork and breathing fire and brimstone. I haven't found that at all in the Word of God. The Word of God says he appears as an angel of light. Ezekiel 28 says he is unsurpassed in his beauty. Yes, he appears not as he's depicted, friends. That's why he deceives people. He comes as an angel of light. He's unsurpassed in his beauty. This is what the Word of God says. He was the most beautiful creature that God had made. And it was his beauty that caused pride in his heart. And his heart was lifted up. And he said, I'll exalt my throne above God. And he carried away a large part of the angels of heaven with him. And a case I remember where a woman I was teaching 
I must have mentioned this because she came after and said, it's like you say, he said, my husband was dying of cancer. So he lay there in the hospital room, said the devil appeared to him, appeared to him in physical form and said he was quite a charming fellow. He said he was a beautiful, handsome person. Very charming words. He said, you remember when you were out in the world serving me, you didn't have that. He said, if you come back and serve me, he said, I'll take it off of you, which tells you the source of what he had. Right. No, he didn't appear with horns and a pitchfork. And I was speaking up in Columbus, Ohio a few years ago when there was a brother there holding a meeting and I just happened to pass there, wanted to hear him. And so they asked me if I'd teach uh, their Bible class, which I did. And then he spoke. Then we went out to dinner together, lunch, and uh, we got to talking and I was sharing things about the occult with him. And he had a tremendous gift of the word of knowledge which operated in every service, and it was a real blessing to be there. It was an unusual kind of operation, the word of knowledge. And uh, I discovered, I'd never heard him before, but I have sense that he has quite a ministry all over the country. He's an evangelist, good teacher, with this exceptional gift of the word of knowledge. And so, as we were talking about the occult, he said, Do you know, the reality of the devil is something that most people do not understand, but he said, he has actually appeared to me in physical form trying to get me off this ministry. You know, most people think the devil, because he's a spirit, that uh, if they believe in him, that he does not have the power to do what angels did in the Old Testament and the New Testament. They often appeared as men. Hebrews 13, 2. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for some have entertained angels unawares. Amen. Amen. Lord, help us to remember that. I mean, I'd hate to turn somebody away and discover some time later he was an angel. But the devil has the same power to take on physical form. And so he, he said in my service one night, I was in California preaching, and he said, after the service, a man came up and said, I've got a word from the source. Well, he said, the only source I knew was God, so I thought it was a word from the Lord. So I said, let's go into my study. And he said, this, this person took on a radiance that was heavenly and began to tell me things about my past that only myself and God knew. Went all the way back to my childhood. He said things like this. said, remember when you were six? And he said he put everything in the first person. I was there, you see. He said he had a, a radiant beauty that was otherworldly, heavenly. And he said... Took him back, he said, you remember when you were six years old, I was there. And he said, you remember when the wheel fell off your wagon and you got out and kicked it and cursed? He said, I smiled at that. Well, that ought to give away who he was. In his presence, he said he felt in the presence of deity. He says his eyes were the eyes of Jesus. Now remember, an angel of light is how he appears, friends. And he said, I felt myself drawn to him to fall down and worship him. That's Jesus Christ. But you know, being baptized in the Holy Spirit is profitable, friends. If for no other reason, it will save you Amen. time and time again. If you learn how to listen to the voice of the Spirit, he said there was just a little check in my spirit. Ask him 1 John 4, 1. As he was falling down to worship him, he said, do you believe Jesus Christ came in the flesh? He said, just like that, the radiance disappeared. And very stern look, and he said, what's that got to do with what we're talking about? Well, he said, that gave him away, an angel. Away. He said, what in the, the things he was telling me about my ministry, you've come to a place now where you've fulfilled your ministry as an evangelist, and I've got a church over here in Hollywood, California. I want you to be pastor of that, and I'm going to bless it, you see. Oh, wouldn't the devil like to get some people in an old dead church somewhere? that has an anointed ministry with word of knowledge and souls are getting saved and people are getting <coughs> baptized in the Holy Spirit and getting out of his clutches in the process. And he said shortly after that it just evaporated, disappeared. Right before my eyes and others, he just, just disappeared. Oh yeah, the devil appears as an angel of light. Christians are not taught how he appears. Without the Holy Spirit, read verses of Scripture and try to put their interpretation to them on the basis of 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary goes about as a roaring lion. They're waiting for him to roar. They don't think they have a whole thing to worry about till they see his hoofs, smell his fire and brimstone, and hear him roar. That isn't 
the way he appears, that's his purpose. He goes about to devour as a lion. He appears in unsurpassed beauty. He'll come to you as an angel of light. I mean, literally envision or to your mind with these great, wonderful, pious, religious thoughts that won't promote the kingdom of God one iota. He's got half the Christians, and I'm being conservative. Oh, I ought to tell it like it is. He's got 90% of the Christians. So busy in religious activity, they don't have time for the work of the kingdom. If you say, are you saying it's inspired of the devil? If I couldn't make it any plainer, there's no point in me saying what I just said. And if you can't handle it, then God help you to handle it. God is not in the denominations, friends. You've just got to receive it. He didn't originate it. He has nothing to do with it. And he keeps showing his servants time and again that the denominational system is Babylon and it's going down, down, down. There's very, very little life in it now and he's going to take away the little spark that's left. If the people don't get out of it, who get the Holy Ghost? They'll go down with it. I have to answer to him. I don't have to answer to people. Because that's what he says. Pray for God to give you grace to receive it. Because it's true. And so the devil is a deceiver, a seducer. He appears as an angel of light. I've had others tell me the same thing. We don't have time to go into it all. One woman in church saw him as an angel of light. And then he revealed himself, who he was. Another woman, he appeared to her for 17 years as Jesus Christ himself. 17 years she followed the devil. Why? Because she was following a vision. We believe in visions. We've had several here tonight. I had one this morning in the service. That isn't what I'm saying. Put a little 1 John 4, 1 to your visions. <laughs> Try the spirits. And everything went bad for her for 17 years. Lost husband, business, and every health, and everything else. She finally, in utter disgust, challenged it. I plead the blood of Jesus against the vision. And it turned into the devil. And then he laughed at her. He said, I've been deceiving you for 17 years. Now you lost your salvation. You've committed the unpardonable sin. Well, she'd had enough of that. She had sense enough to laugh at him. <laughs> Amen. He tells you you've committed the unpardonable sin, you haven't. <laughs> Amen. If he tells you you can't be saved, then you're safe because he doesn't bother with those that uh, have committed it. I mean, they know it, he knows it, and it's not a question of, of him trying to convince you of it. All the devil's real. I mean, he's so real that... He deludes people into thinking that, that he isn't real. He's very subtle. Oh, he'll give himself away when he's cornered. Are those who worship him? He appears in the hideous nature he is. He's a beautiful creature, but he, he is hideous in his nature, his inner nature. So then he appears as the old black goat, as he's described all through man's history. Satanists who worship him. He often appears as a goat, a ram with hooves. That's where they got the idea. He's bringing forth his nature uh, as some hideous creature. Sometimes he appears as a hog or a stinking creature because that's his nature. But he's much more subtle to most people. That's why he deceives them. You get him cornered, why well, he'll admit who he is. I've had the old devil try to deceive me through people you were delivering, you know. One case tried to offer me power and revelation. The, the spirit was a spirit of revelation, of divination in this person. Was willing to give me that if I would leave him alone. Well, only a fool would have sense enough to take an offer like that directly from the devil's lips. And yet people do it. He doesn't have to be wily or appear as an angel light to some people. They just seem to fall for everything. <laughs> I was up in... Minnesota a few years ago speaking and they had a deliverance minister there. They cast out demons all night. It's hard to get sleep some night. 
the people would come there and they really took them through some deliverance. The demons, just like in the Bible, came out screaming and yelling. And they would have camp for all through the summer and then speakers would stay a week. I was there a couple of times for a week. We were talking about deliverance and the devil and the occult, you know, one day. The uh, brother in charge of the Christian retreat said, we really had a funny experience. Some people recommended that we get a couple of people to come and teach and speak, and we'd never heard of them, but uh, they were recommended highly by some people who were here, so I said, uh, I had their name, address, phone number, and called them up. And he said, uh, when I called, they said, well, you know, it's interesting, when you called, we were playing with the Ouija board, and uh, you're inviting us to come. Well, of course, right away, he knew that was occult uh, because he was delivering people from oppression as a result of playing with the Ouija board. So they said, if you wait a minute, we'll go ask it whether or not we should come. Well, he just played along with them. <laughs> and here are people out preaching the gospel, at least supposed to be preaching the gospel. Christian ministry, going around the country. And he said they came back to the phone, said we can't come. He said, why? Well, the Ouija board said no. Well, he said, you ask it why? He said, yes, said, you people are the devil. <laughs> you people are the devil. So the devil had the, them deceive, telling them the Christians were the devil, and that's why they couldn't come. As I say, the devil doesn't have to be too subtle with some people. <laughs> Literally, I went into a city right here in this state, and the Lord sent me in there at the right time because right, right when I came, they were debating or discussing the question of whether or not they should take a Ouija board, a Methodist church, to their prayer meeting to discern the will of the Lord. They knew no more about the occult than that. And there may be people here tonight that know no more about the occult than that. They say, well, what's wrong with that? I've had one. We've had one in our house. Made an end table out of it. <laughs> Can you imagine that? The pastor and the people going to take a Ouija board to prayer meeting. The devil doesn't have to be too subtle with some people. He doesn't have to appear as an angel of light. All he has to do is use a little power of suggestion. But Jesus in Matthew 24, as Paul does in 2 Corinthians 11, tells us that just as he has ministers, as God has ministers, so does the devil. And they're called apostles, angels of light, false apostles, false prophets. The devil has his apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. You say, well, how in the world can we discern the difference? Well, that's what we've been teaching you, friends. That's why we labor in the Word. Isaiah 8, 20, if they speak not according to this Word, it's because there's no light in them. You've got to know the Word to know when they're not speaking according to this Word, don't you? And so if you're going to play church like most churches have been doing for too long now, then that's why most Christians are being deluded and deceived in this hour and have been deluded and deceived. Believe things that they think is the word of God that completely negates the power of God in their lives, their church. Because it's not of God. It's not God's word. Another test, the test of character, Matthew 7. By their fruits you'll know them. You can't always tell by the word. Sometimes their words are charming. Amen. So test them according to the word. Test them according to their character, according to their life. One or the other. Sometimes, of course, their life is above reproach. Jean Dixon has always spoken of as a very religious person. But she is a fortune teller, a witch, a sorceress. And so how are you going to tell? You can't go by her character. It's above reproach. Better than some people in the churches. But Isaiah 20 says she doesn't speak according to this word, therefore there's no light in her. All you have to do is listen to her prognostications, her statements, her theology. You'd only need to know one thing about what she believes and teaches, that one day Christianity is not the ultimate, the end, the final revelation of God, but there one day is coming a universal religion that's going to replace Christianity and all men will be united in a world brotherhood. Oh, if that isn't the old devil. And if you know the word, you'll know there's nothing in the word about the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man taught in the word of God, except that God is the father of all creation and that we are all brothers by blood. But they mean spiritually that God is our father and that we're all brothers in the spirit. 
So she doesn't have the word. And sometimes they have the word, but they don't have the life with it. Like this man I told you about who goes about seducing women. And two, as I say, I know personally, I know personally of it. I didn't hear about it. I know personally. Plus all of the other charges uh, that have been made. And over half the world, as I say, he's charged with this. But I'll tell you, when he preaches, he can bring tears to your eyes. If you don't know his character. Very pious. Humble, he'll sleep on the floor to give you his bed. He'll give you his last penny. Very charming. You can't find out a man's character in a day or week, you see. You have to be around a person long enough, or he has to be around. But here's one of the tests you have to know. And of course, if you know something of Garner Ted Armstrong's ministry, that he was off the air a while. You listen to his message. Many times it's right on. I'm not talking about the legalism and the law and where they're off because we've taught you about that, where they're off. But he can charm his audiences. He's a very eloquent speaker. And he speaks on the social issues and the low morality and he brings into to focus what's wrong with our country and wrong with the churches. And he's just right on the word of God with that. Many times. But why was he off the air? Read the news reports in the magazine. Sexual sins. Read the articles. Gambling in Reno. Following the women around. Then comes on the air and preaches against all of those things. Now, I'm only telling you what is common knowledge in the news reports. So it isn't always the message. Of course, in his case, if you know the word, the message will give him away eventually. And so both tests will apply. So Satan is a deceiver, and he's a seducer, and he will beguile, and he will charm, and he will use the powers of suggestion. The word of God has much to say about our needing to keep our minds, bodies, souls, spirits, under the blood of Jesus, under its protection, free from all temptation and sin. Father, in Jesus' name, let the reality of the power of the blood of Jesus be known to every person who sits under this word tonight or hears the tape. Let there be nothing in their mind or thinking, our theology, past doctrine or belief, that would allow access to their minds by Satan to destroy the effectiveness of this word. I plead the blood of Jesus against every hindrance, offensive work of the enemy in the minds of the people who hear this message. In Jesus' name, we rebuke the powers of darkness. We cover our minds with the precious blood of the Lamb. We claim the victory in the mighty name of Jesus over the adversary and his power, the works of darkness, we rebuke them. We come against them in faith that Jesus has overcome and has given us power over all the power of the enemy as we use it by faith, his name and his blood. Hallelujah, hallelujah.